Welcome into the Shucking Around Podcast. I'm your host, Garrett Green. Episode number four for you today, and we will dive straight into it. We have the 2021 Brewers Minor League Pitcher of the Year. Ethan Small is our guest on the podcast today. It was fantastic to get Ethan on after he started eight games for the Biloxi Shuckers in 2021 as part of his phenomenal season. He talks about the season that he had, including overcoming a finger injury, what led to it, what he's done to mitigate that, and how he bounced back to finish off the season very well. Also talks about what it meant for him to be the 2021 Brewers Minor League Pitcher of the Year, what his goals are for next season. We also talk about his devastating changeup, how he developed that pitch, what he does to make it work the way that he does, and why it is so effective for him. Uh, Plus, we talk about his experience in the Dominican Winter League this last year. So all of that, part of a great conversation with Ethan Small. Uh, If you missed any of our previous episodes, you can check them out in the archives. We had Corey Howe on episode three of the podcast, uh, outfielder and infielder for the Biloxi Shuckers at the back end of 2021. He was the minor league player of the month for the month of May in 2021, and he's likely going to be back with us to start the season. Episode two, we had David Fry talking about his experience in 2021, as well as Greg Young talking about a lot of the great prospect talent. And all the way back to episode number one, we had Sam Dykstra on the podcast talking about some of the best prospects that were in the Arizona Fall League. So you can catch all of that in the archives. If you like this podcast, be sure to leave us a comment, rate, subscribe. Uh, but for now, We'll go to Ethan Small, our guest here on episode number four of the Shucking Around podcast. Well, as we said, our guest today, he was the 2021 Brewers Minor League Pitcher of the Year. He was the SEC Pitcher of the Year while he was there. And uh, when he was a member of the Biloxi Shuckers, he authored the first five innings of the first nine inning no hitter in franchise history. Ethan Small is with us today. Ethan, thanks so much for joining us for a few minutes. We're thrilled to catch up with you. Yeah, no problem. Happy to be here. Yeah. So I'll start with one of those accolades. Um, What was the experience like for you to be named the Brewers minor league pitcher of the of the year for last season for the 2021 that you had? Right. Um, I say definitely a goal of mine uh, just because I wanted to come out, especially being first full year at pro ball, obviously the alt site year, which was kind of a wash in terms of just not really getting to do a whole lot and then having to train and then play a full season right after. Um, So definitely a goal of mine. And then obviously, there were some injury concerns in there, obviously, with the, the finger injury thing, and then had to just come back and pitch well and uh, ended up getting it. So very proud. So you mentioned that and you, you kind of had a finger in you it didn't kind of you had a finger injury in July. Um, and for folks who might not have heard about that, what what exactly happened there that shelved you for a couple of weeks that you were ultimately able to come back from? Mm-hmm. So what happened? It's hard to explain. It's a very common uh, injury in rock climbers, I was told, and uh, very strange for baseball players. But basically, it's it's pretty much can only result from squeezing the baseball too hard. And um, when I was pretty much experiencing uh, experimenting with that slider, I was throwing you know throwing tons of different ones. And I'm definitely not going to give anything away about that one, uh, just because I don't even know how I could because it's changed so much. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, just too much grip pressure on the ball, and I think over and over in bullpens and games it just kind of the ligament or tendon or whatever it was in there kind of just gave up on me a little bit uh never ruptured never tore it it was just very aggravated is what I was told yeah so uh I mean I know you've talked about it a little bit I think you did an interview with the hum Hadricourt with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel you said you and you just said you kind of scrapped that grip and you and you redid it a little bit so is it is it still like a slider? Did you say it's kind of like I've heard this phrase from a couple of guys? It's like a bullet pitch for you. So it's it's not that big sweep that a slider, but it's a different off speed pitch to mix in. Right. So uh, this pitch has two years of history. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> I started out throwing the the bullet version. Kind of that's what I was pitched. That's what we were going to work on. Personally, I didn't like it. I couldn't really throw it for a strike. Like something about it just wasn't right in my hand so then I guess it starts this past spring I guess I I find something new that kind of plays more off of a four seam type grip but it demanded that extra grip pressure because it's coming out of more of a a lower like hand position so I had to really hold on to the ball to not let it slip Um, and it moved a ton that's the one I was throwing in Biloxi for the most part I would say Mm-hmm. Um, and had some good results with it too, but it, it was so, I had to squeeze the heck out of the ball and kind of figured out that wasn't going to work anymore. So it kind of went back to a more 
bullet ish pitch and then kind of found something that I like a lot. Um, can still throw at the same velocity and moves up probably a little bit more than the original bullet did and a lot more control over it. So I'm happy with where it is now. Those are the things that really count uh, control movement, and, and being able to throw it for a strike. And I know that's massive. Um, you know, finger injuries. I mean, we saw, I think that, you know, Tyler Glasnow mentioned how, you know, really gripping the heck out of the ball kind of did him in this season is what right. his thought process was. So I'm sure you're glad that you avoided that. And of course, a, a finger injury isn't, you know, quite the same as like Tommy John, which you've, right. you've obviously already had before, but how much did that like experience with a, a long rehab process help you? And and what do you do for a rock climbing injury that guys normally right. experience? So gosh, where to start with this one? So it's, it was extremely frustrating just from like, you know, just moved up to Nashville, pitching well, like everything feels nice. I'm getting the groove of AAA finally. Like my first start was kind of rough, couldn't really find the zone and then started to settle in. And then kind of like, as soon as we're, you know, going pretty good, it's like, I can't grab the baseball. I've got to tell somebody about this because I had been dealing with it for a while, but it was mostly just soreness, like nothing that you're going to go tell a trainer about just because it kind of goes away the next day or whatever. Mm -hmm. And eventually that became not the case. And it just kept dragging on and on and on. And it would be back time to start day. And then it still hurts. Um, but I would say if you could pick an injury, like if you had to have one, it's not a bad one to have. Um, it's, but like I said, it's extremely, it's very annoying injury just because it's all grip pressure is pretty much gone. Um, and you can't really throw anything without that. So from that standpoint, it's very frustrating, but definitely if I had to pick one, that would be the one I'd pick. Yeah. Well, and you came back and you pitched really well down the back half of the season. And that kind of segues me into the next thing, which was you got to go pitch in the Dominican winter league. And I have a couple of different questions about that. And I'm going to, I'm going to start with this, which is like, how do you go about getting signed by a Dominican winter league team? Is that something that they reached out to you? Did the brewers facilitate that? The, what's the process that you went through that was ultimately landing in the Dominican for, for five starts in the winter? So most, pretty much all of that came from the Brewers saying, uh, you know, you've missed some time. We want you to get closer to that hundred inning mark so we can, you know, possibly push it into like the 120, 130 next year, um, just for like next year to be safe to actually have that type of volume. So that was a big thing. And I was a little bit skeptical. I didn't really want to do it because I was pitching well. And I was like, I don't know if I need to, but uh, yeah, they facilitate it. And then obviously you kind of get with the team after they, connect you and your agent they contract it up and then you just sign it and go play so that's what i did do you speak any spanish or did you speak any spanish when you went down um, there? i will say no but i the only thing i can do is spanish. i can read it like if somebody wrote it out to me i could read it and eventually figure out what they were saying but with like all the different slang and how they how they talk and how fast they can speak it and i, <laughs> I just can't keep up so it was <laughs> the language barrier was definitely real but um, i definitely learned a little bit of it for sure I, I assume so. They Hey, they say the best way to learn a language is immersion. And I'm sure that being in a clubhouse yes. all, yep. all day with guys. Mm -hmm. Did you have anybody on your team that kind of served as like a, a translator? I know we were fortunate here in Biloxi that for a couple of years, we had Luis Avilas Jr. He's from Cuba. He was bilingual. So he was always my go-to guy. Did you have anybody that could kind of help you bridge that gap there in the clubhouse? Yeah, uh, there was definitely, there was, I think we had probably six or seven American guys and a couple of them actually had played down there for you know a number of years and I didn't realize there's a whole different side of professional baseball that these guys play it they'll only play in those leagues like some of the older guys um and they're pretty close to fluent so I mean that's definitely a great resource to have when you're young and relative to you know the, that league's age it's just a bunch of MLB vets it feels like um to kind of help you navigate it no, I, but I mean, you know, you got the opportunity to pitch against guys who have put up a lot of big league time, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm sure that was really valuable for you. I've also heard though that the environment, because Mike Guerrero has he he obviously is managed down there a little bit. He's from the Dominican right. Republic. Mm -hmm. It's like an intense atmosphere. Like if you have two bad outings, Asta La Vista, we don't need you anymore. If right. I'm not uh, mistaken, yes, I definitely felt that. Um, of course, I I've, most of my outings went pretty well there. I had one that just you know, from the first inning, but I will say um, the leashes are very short. Mm -hmm. It's not like minor league baseball where it's like, you're going six innings. If you can get there in a hundred pitches, no matter what, mm -hmm. 
it's like, yeah, you gave up a run, man. We're thinking we're probably just going to take you out here. And that was the case. And it's, and that, I think that's kind of what the Brewers wanted me to experience was like the need to win now in the moment, this minute, we have to win the game. And that, that's really what it is down there. Like every game matters a lot. And if like, I mean, I think one time I gave up a leadoff double and the pin was going and I was like 10 pitches into a start. And I'm like, seriously? When was the last time you were 10 pitches into a start and the bullpen got going? Maybe never. Honestly. I was gonna, I don't even think I mean, a, a college world series yeah. game, a, a super regional. I don't even yeah. think they would have gotten that fast in either yeah. of those. No, because the team's going to be like, look, man, you might give up a few, but we got to get, we get, we don't have a bullpen, but that was the thing. There's so many guys on that roster. They have, they have signed so many people that, that it's like the starter. Like if you go three, four innings, the game is covered. Like you're fine. So <laughs> it's pretty much like, do your best, but if you start, you know, we start seeing the ball well, the other team starts seeing the ball well and hitting, making some hard contact, it's like, eh, let's get him out of there. There's the hook. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, you were on the same team that Albert Pujols ended up joining, if yes. I'm not mistaken, correct? Mm-hmm. Were, were you there while he was a part of the team? Yes, I was. He came in, uh, I'll say I was probably there two weeks. He came in a little after I did, and I probably had a couple more weeks there. And But that that was unreal, man. That, yeah. Do you get to chat with him at all or pick his brain? Yeah. I mean, just mostly small talk stuff. You know, I didn't want to like bother because I know how it has to be with people coming up to you all the time, asking for pictures and stuff. So I didn't do any of that, but um, a little bit of small talk. Um, Of course, that was my favorite player growing up by far. That was the guy who I looked up to. Of course, I was never going to be a hitter, obviously being tall and left-handed and uh, (laughs) with like zero power, but um, that was my favorite player. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, growing up there just outside of like the Jackson, Tennessee area, Lexington, like St. Louis is, I've talked to Chris Harris before, and St. Louis is like the closest market to you guys there, right? Yeah, I would say most fans there are, I would say mostly Cardinals fans. Of course, you have some some Cubs people. We don't like them. And then like- <laughs> You get to just carry that Braves. along. Yeah, sometimes the Braves, but you usually get into that the further south you go. Yeah, no, that makes sense. You get into the, the Turner landlock area, which you obviously got a great experience with being down here in the the Southeastern region for pretty much the entirety of last season. Um, I'll take you back to 2020 and you mentioned it. I know the alternate site was like a little maddening because it's just, you're facing the same guys every day and it's not, you know, you can play inter squads and scrimmages, but it's not the same as like somebody in a different uniform Mm -hmm. for another organization across from you. But at the same time, what, what do you think was like the most valuable part of the alternate site in 2020, because obviously you got something out of it that helped you have a successful 2021. Right. I would say just the introduction to advanced hitters. Um, that would probably be the biggest thing. Of course, the, it was so monotonous and it's, it's like a it's super long spring training is kind of what it feels like, except, you know, there's nobody, but you 30, however many people we had there. So, um, but I would say just the introduction to advanced hitters, you know, reading their swings as opposed to what I saw previously. Of course, the last thing I saw was low A. Mm-hmm. So completely skipped high and then went straight into double A after that. So that was my first time really facing like a big league caliber hitter. Um, and I had some good outings, but definitely had some bad ones there. It was definitely a struggle, like trying to figure out like, what are these guys, like, what do I do? You know, it's kind of, it kind of felt like that. Um so in that way, it was very frustrating for me because <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. And I'm a guy who wants to figure it out soon and then obviously perform well. But I would say that, yeah, just the introduction of those guys and then kind of like knowing what to expect as you move up the ladder. Yeah. And obviously that prepared you to to pitch very well here at double A and move up to triple A and keep things rolling. Um, you know, you, you talk about the fact that things were, were going so well for you. You were in a really good groove. The injury stopped. You come back. You still pitch well all the way to the end of the season. And I'm sure this probably doesn't enter your mind very much, but like, do you ever think about like the, the bottom falling out and just something doesn't click one day? So like, how do you keep that positive momentum going throughout the course of an entire season, which I know this was your first one, but that whole season going. Mm -hmm. I would say that it may appear that way, but it's definitely not. There's always things every game probably something went wrong in some inning and it's just how quick can you adjust? And that's, that's kind of been my whole thing is I just, I'm trying to adjust quickly. And then my strategy will obviously vary depending on what I see from the hitters. Like I'm, I think sometimes in Biloxi, I threw more changeups than I threw fastballs. 
and that's very atypical of me because especially in college, I mean, I was like 85% fat. Like I was giving you the fastball mm -hmm. and there were some games where I would throw 50% changeups and then other games I would throw 80%. Like I, sometimes I just had to mix it up based on what was working. And then once you identify what's working, you can't obviously switch on that. So, I mean, some games I'd throw 40 changeups just because it kept working. So in that sense, I would say, you know, just adjustments and then not throwing something that they want to see just because that's your MO. Yeah. Well, and you've segued me right into what I wanted to ask you, which is about that changeup in particular, because, you know, we, we obviously were up here in the press box and then calling some games remotely. And I got about, I think it was about four or five starts into your time here. And Nick Childs, the pitching coach texted me and was like, Hey, great job on the call. You're calling all of these curveballs, and they're not. They're changeups, and I don't know if I've seen anybody that throws a changeup that's got the the shape to it along with the velocity that you have. So I know it's something you've talked about that it's a pitch you've worked on, you know, since you were a teenager, and, and you obviously really value the changeup. Right. What is it that you do to give your changeup such a unique shape and velocity that I, I we just don't see very much of? I think the biggest thing is just experience with that exact same grip. Like it's not a pitch like my slider where I've had two years of experiments and I, you know, it's kind of like teeter tottering. Like, is this it? Is it the one? Well, I don't really like it. It's not really been, it's never been that pitch. I've thrown it. Like I said, you know, this, I've thrown it since I was 14, exact same grip. Um, and I've thrown it a lot since then. It's been one of my most used pitches ever since then. And that's probably why my breaking ball has lagged behind because I discovered that so early. Um, but I would say just the feel of it comes from, you know, however X amount of years of throwing that pitch, 10 years, I guess now. Um, and just knowing the intricacies of, you know, what the spin needs to be, um, what it needs to look like. Because I can make it like, actually, you can make that pitch move a lot more than it does. But the problem, it doesn't start, it starts blending or sorry, it starts not blending with fastball. And I found the way to make it blend perfectly with fastball. So they're almost, you know, unidentifiable from one another, obviously, other than the velo. Mm -hmm. And I think that the velo separation, and then obviously the movement separation, are what makes, makes that pitch good. Yeah, you talk about it. And, and I, I mean, you tell me, you already said you throw your changeup kind of a split. It really seemed like while you were mixing the slider in some, it was mostly fastball changeup. And even by the end of your time here in Biloxi, I don't think other hitter, I don't think hitters had any mystery about it. They knew that those were the two pitches that you were going to throw. And it, it just didn't seem to matter all that much. Is that, that kind of what you saw, saw on the mound as well? Uh, right. I think so. Um, and that, that's been the thing with me too. It's like, I think the slider lagging behind in development has just been due to a lack of need mm -hmm. for that third pitch a lot of the time. And it's service and it's always been serviceable. There's a curveball that I throw to didn't throw it much this year just because we were working on the slider a lot um, and they're serviceable and they work fine. But it just, for me, it's very hard to get my brain into throw a breaking ball mode when I have two things that's one's hard, one's slow. They don't see them very well until it's too late. And then I can just play off hard and slow. Like, well, do they think heaters coming? I'm going to throw a changeup or they think changeups coming on throw a fastball. So it's kind of, it's made it simple for me to pitch like that because I only have two options most of the time, obviously I could throw the others, but for yeah. me, it's like two options, hard or slow, which one do you do you want? I'm going to give you the other one. So, and I think that's part of it too, is knowing kind of what they're expecting, what they want. And then you can often, you know, come to that conclusion pretty quickly based on what you're seeing in about the first or second inning. And that, I'm always impressed that guys can, I always see it as hitters can make the adjustment to pitchers, but for you guys to be able to make the adjustment back in a counter to that, it, I think is one of the more impressive things to do in sports. Um, now, obviously you mentioned the fact that you, you have those two options, you're workshopping heading into 2022, like what, you know, if you have a goal, what is the goal for you aside from making it up to the big leagues and pitching well, like what is the goal from a pitch repertoire perspective for you that you'd view as a success for this upcoming season? Right. I would say if I had a checklist, it would be keep backspinning the fastball, make sure the changeup's there. And then after those two things are my guarantee, like those need to be there. And then we start throwing the slider. Same as kind of in season last year. It's just a continuation of that. In my opinion, I don't want to like, I'm not reinventing myself. I'm just adding to it. So I want to make sure that what makes me me is still there. And then 
throw in the slider that starting to feel a lot better now. Uh, are there any advanced metrics that you look at or are there any kind of tools that you utilize more than others? I know that some guys like to take a look at, you know, their spin rate and that helps them with pitch shape. Um, you know, is it Rapsodo, it's Tronics, TrackMan? Like, is there any of the more advanced metrics that you really rely on or is it just kind of feel and, and what information you're getting back from your coaches? Mm -hmm. So I would say a little bit of both. Um, a lot of times the, the data will match up with a certain feel you had. And then you use that field to get the same data, if that makes sense. When you yeah. identify numbers that are good, you say, okay, well, what did that feel like? I'm going to do that again. And uh, that's pretty, that's how I have work on my fastball every year. I want to make sure it's backspinning almost perfectly. And that's kind of difficult to do. Sometimes you'll start cutting or running it like a two seam. So for that one, I use spin direction for the most part, spin direction, and then change up or sorry, um, yeah, I guess spin direction on both, I would say probably for fastball and change up. Fastball is going to be close to 12 o'clock because it's doing this, obviously, and then change up. Change up is a little tricky. It can be anywhere from like 1030 to like nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. And when you get down into that nine range, you start seeing those like really heavy dropping change ups. And then obviously the more you get up into like 10. So like basically for like dummy course, it's like lower the spin direction on a change up, the more it's going to have like vertical depth. Mm -hmm. Um, but you don't want to get into that too much because you start throwing this like big lobby thing and they see it. So you have to have one that kind of blends in there. That's like this. And that's kind of what I focus on. Yeah. Um, so what are you doing right now in the off season? I mean, obviously you're, you're back home just kind of outside of Nashville right now, but what's a, a day like for you? Because I know that, you know, not, not being on the 40 man roster yet, you have a little bit more of a firm deadline for when things are going to start right now. So what's a, a day like you for you right now, getting ready for the season? Right. I think the biggest thing for me that I probably struggled with in the past, especially coming off a of college season, like going all the way back to when I got drafted, it was a very taxing year for me. I mean, there'll be some games I was throwing 120, 100 and close to 130 pitches. And, um, I didn't really recover super great from that just from lack of experience, having thrown with that type of volume. So my last two spring trainings, I've had a little bit of like impingement stuff, like shoulders kind of barking at me, nothing really wrong, obviously, but just like not built up to like start. And then I would catch up after I got sent back down to minor league camp, I would start feeling good. And I'm like, well, great. I should have done this earlier, obviously. So I think this year, this off season, pretty much every day is trying to avoid that. And uh, I'm not having any of those problems right now because I've thrown a ton and I'm going to keep throwing a ton and uh, make sure that doesn't happen again. That's massive to get ready for the season. Um, you know, I I'm sure that being at AAA, you obviously had a rub with a lot of guys who kind of bounce back and forth between the big leagues. And I'm sure that you've had a little bit of an experience talking with the guys at the major league level as well. I'm sure Brandon Woodruff is one of those names as well with a Mississippi state tie. Are, are there any guys on the staff that you've been able to chat with and, and have helped you workshop with what you're throwing or kind of what to do to prepare yourself for, you know, hopefully the jump from triple a to the major league level. Right. I would say for the most part, those conversations kind of happen. Like it's a lot of dugout conversations when you're kind of like standing by a guy or whatever. And we, we had Josh Lindblom pretty much in AAA the whole time. And that guy's done it all, been everywhere and pitched there. So, you know, talking to him and then obviously guys like Luke Maley, a veteran catcher. Um, and I won't even say anything specifically. It's kind of just like they're, they'll tell stories around each other and you kind of get to hear how things work, what they hated, what they liked. And it, that I would say I, I couldn't even get specific if I wanted to because I don't remember anything. But that's just the takeaway I had was that feeling like just hearing their experiences maybe help going forward. Yeah, that was something that uh, David Fry said to us was just getting up to AAA and you were just rubbing elbows with guys who right. – have been in the show before and it's just being around them being around their families because i know we had some families here at double a but it's a little bit more prospect and single guys and things like that and you get up to triple a and that's you know guys who have multiple kids and families right. and all that kind of stuff and so they have a lot more real life experience yes i think so i think fry's probably said it best it's just being around them consistently so they start to rub off on you for sure all right so we obviously are going to have uh mississippi state back here playing two games, uh, March 8th and 9th. 
and they're going to be playing Texas Tech. Um, what can you tell folks down in Biloxi? Because I'm, I'm sure you keep up with Mississippi State baseball just a little bit mm-hmm. um, still. Wh- who are the names to look for? What, what should people be excited about for State coming down to the coast for a couple of games? I will say I don't know a ton, but I do know this. I know Landon Sims is turning into the Friday night guy. I'm excited to see what he does. He's got electric stuff. Obviously going to be a great professional at some point. Um, and that's going to be a pretty electric matchup if they if they do that the right way. I don't know. Is it midweek games? Yeah, it's Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay, Tuesday, so, Wednesday. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, that's obviously going to be a great series. I expect that stadium to be sold out, packed. Yep. Um, that would be nice. And uh, hopefully the Bulldogs take two dubs. It is uh, right now. I we only things that are available as we're recording this on uh, January twenty fifth. And it's on till March. The only things that are available are down the lines. Um, everything behind the dugouts and home plate is all pretty much sold, except for a couple of individual tickets. The suite level is all sold out. And when we did this back in 2020, uh, we had two essential sellouts. So right. I'm, I'm expecting more of the same. I and those fill up for state, sure. <laughs> state took both of those uh, six, right. three, and then three, two with a seventh inning rally in both yep. of those. So, I would expect more of the same. Do you get back to Starkville at all during the off season to go, you know, catch up with, with Chris and the staff there and right. train a little bit, or are you mostly just based in Nashville for the whole off season? Uh, mostly based in Nashville. I, I've been meaning to go back. I just haven't had really had the time to do it. Um, just as far as like scheduling and like just wanting to be in a rhythm in my house training where I am, you know, is kind of my thing. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely find a way to get back down there at some point and hang out with some of the guys and uh, train there. Yeah. No, I mean, hey, it's a good problem to have to be in a, a regimented offseason routine and really have your eyes looking forward to 2022. Uh, I would wholeheartedly expect that we are uh, not going to see you back here again. And that's fantastic. But uh, obviously, you had a fantastic run while you were here. As I already said, authored, uh, you know, the first five innings of the first nine inning no hitter we had. Uh, tied the franchise record for strikeouts in a game uh, and very quickly went up to triple A for all the right reasons. But Ethan, good luck next season. Uh, We can't wait to see what you do. And thanks again for taking a few minutes to chat with us. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Well, again, a big thanks to Ethan Small. Fantastic insight from him. We got into the nitty gritty of some of the pitching. And it's always great to hear these guys' perspective about what a great season is like for them and what they're looking forward to in 2022. Uh, As we said at the very end there, don't expect to see Ethan and Biloxi again. I'd expect that he'll be at Nashville to start next season. And it probably won't be very long before we see him pitching up in Milwaukee if he keeps on trending at the rate that he is right now. Uh, If you have any thoughts about guests that you'd like for us to get on the podcast, go ahead and leave us a comment, whether it's on social media for the Biloxi Shuckers. Uh, You can find me on Twitter at Garrett underscore Green. Let us know who you'd like for us to grab there, uh, or you can comment down below wherever you listen to your podcast, Spotify, Apple podcast, be sure to like rate, subscribe this podcast, uh, go ahead and give us a follow. So that way you can be up to date with it. And as always, you can catch a video version of this uh, over on YouTube. The official Biloxi Shuckers YouTube page has all of these on video for you there. That's going to do it for this, for this episode of the Shucking Around podcast though. We're thrilled that you tuned in and caught our conversation with Ethan Small. We'll see you next time on the Shucking Around podcast.